I must say that it's really nice to be face to face, not just uh, on the ether, so to speak. And in many ways, I'm returning to what I was talking about as president in 2019, which seems now such a long ago, so long ago when the Cambrians were down in Pembrokeshire. Because what I'm going to talk about today in many ways is related to monument biography. Um, because when we look at the early medieval um, carved stones in Wales and how they were recorded and illustrated in the 19th and early 20th centuries, or indeed before that, we're looking at an essential part of their life histories, their biographies. And if you remember, Sally Foster um, has done an enormous amount of research on the casts of early medieval carved stones, particularly um, in Scotland. And she, has, and indeed uh, on the concrete replica of St John's Cross in Iona. And this has brought home to me how the way that uh, the carved stones are illustrated are part of these biographies. So what I want to do today is to discuss some of the major developments in recording these monuments between the late 17th century, when Edward Fluid was working, up to the mid 20th century, when Nash Williams was uh, produced uh, the early Christian monuments of Wales. And I want to look particularly at the move from engravings to photographs, which we can see in the course of the later 19th century. And we can see the in the pages of Archaeologia um, Cambrensis. So if we begin um, by moving back to the late sixth, uh, 17th century and um, looking at Edward Floyd. And um, we can see here, um, he was responsible for the Welsh entries in Camden's Britannia um, in its uh, Gibson edition, first in 1695, and then after his death, um, some more appeared in 1722. So we can see, I mean, Edward Floyd, we can see in the early pages, the early volumes of uh, Archaeologia Cambrensis, how important Edward Floyd's work, Floyd's work on the early medieval carved stones was to um, the early scholars who were looking at these in the mid 19th century, because they were reproducing his letters and so forth in the early volumes. Now, at the time Edward Floyd was working, um, we don't have very much surviving of his personal notebooks, but one does survive um, in the National Library, and you can see a page of that here showing um, the Por Beth Porius, the stone at um, Traus Venez, um, which he was the first one to, uh, dis to record um, in about 1699. And you can see his very simple drawing and you can see um, his little notes in his field notebook. Now, when he came to um, publish this in um, Gibson's uh, edition of Camden's Britannia, um, we can see that the amount of illustrations was very limited. And the reason for this was that they were awfully difficult to reproduce. And um, therefore, there's one page, which you can see on the left there, of his, uh, which is a combined illustration, which is a copper plate engraving. And you can see minor quiver up on the top left there and various other things, uh, bits of archeology span and fossils and things. But then on the right, in the text itself, there are a number of the inscribed stones that uh, the fifth, sixth century inscribed stones that are reproduced. And here we can see just two from Canwilgayo in Carmarthenshire. Now these are woodcut engravings um, with the inked lines in relief. And this makes them uh, 
really quite uh, simple. You can't produce anything terribly complicated using this method um, unless you're a fine art engraver. But these are much more day to day um, engravings. So this is what we was around for archaeologists to use in the late 17th century. If we now um, we move on just to look at one more example, we can see um, we're very lucky with uh, Floyd that his manuscript, which was sent to Gibson for the production of Camden's Britannia, still survives. And this is in Cardiff Public Library. And you can see a page of it here. This is the Kevin Geshe Gaia inscribed stone um, in Glamorgan. And we can see Edward's, Edward Floyd's uh, careful um, uh, uh, manuscript of this with the illustrations, complete with the inscription upside down for some reason. And then we can see how it's reproduced in the pages on the, that page in Camden's Britannia. And you can see again um, how the drawing is rendered into the engraving. So I want to now move on to, uh, well, 100 years or so into the um, later 18th century. And I want to look at the work of Moses Griffith, um, who uh, was the uh, draftsperson for Thomas Pennant. And it, between 1778 and, 80, and 1783, Thomas Pennant's Tours of Wales was um, published. And as I'm sure you'll know, um, he, it's a popular guide and uh, Thomas Pennant uh, recorded um, uh, uh, the excavations at the Pillar of Eliseg, for example, in that guide and brought, and these monuments through that guide were beginning to come to a much wider audience. Now, the illustrations in uh, Thomas Pennant's uh, uh, Tours of Wales, all done by Moses Griffith, who um, you can see in this uh, picture here, um, towards the end of his life, um, were, sometimes uh, um, scenic, sometimes houses, but I've just included the Pillar of Eliseg here, which is shown sort of half reconstructed. And um, also uh, he took some, Moses Griffith at that time, more of Edward Floyd's um, recordings, uh, records still existed. So he produced some of the inscribed, drawings of inscribed stones in Thomas Pennant's book from Edward Floyd's drawings. And you can see a group of those on the left. But again, we're dealing with um, engravings. Um, I think these are still uh, relief engravings. Now, I now want to take a step onwards again into the mid 19th century. And we're going to be looking now at the work of the Cambrians. Now, I should say that we're going to be looking almost entirely at the work of men. Um, and this is because the Cambrians really, up until comparatively recently, and indeed archaeology in Wales, was dominated by men. I think perhaps the first real, uh, first woman to come through really was Eileen Fox, I think, in the middle of the uh, uh, 20th century. So the first person I want to talk about is J.O. Westwood, who uh, was a professor of entomology or zoology at Oxford University, but he had time in his spare time somehow to record the early medieval inscribed stones and stone sculpture of Wales. And in uh, 1876 to nine, he published the first corpus called Lacodarium Walliae. And um, this was filled with um, engravings. I had heard that his daughters had produced the drawings for these, but I've never been able to find anything in print to support that. Anyway, we can see from um, most of the uh, Lapidarium Walliae is produced from articles in Archaeologia Cambrensis. And on the left here, we can see an article 
on the stones, um, uh, the stone at, um, in, well, it's in Pembrokeshire, the Pembrokeshire land of Cilio. And we can see the original um, uh, engraving that was produced. Again, it's quite simple. It's um, uh, a relief engraving, as we'll see um, some exam an example in a minute. And you can see how the same stone um, and the other from uh, Landacilio on the bottom right were produced um, in his lapidarium, Walliai. And we can see him in old age, um, very venerable um, in, in the photograph. Now, if we um, move on a slide, we can see one of these early, um, I'm very uh, thankful to Heather James here, who has been sending me photographs um, and uh, lots of information when I've needed it, because um, this, the, looking at these engravings is something new to me. Now, in the previous picture, we saw the engraving. There was a cartouche. Maybe I can go back. No, I, I won't try and do that. Anyway, at the bottom, there was a cartouche um, uh, which said it was J.O. Westwood's drawing. And then it, it said that the in, engraving had been produced, uh, the woodcut of the engraving had been produced by S.O. Utting. Now, neither Heather nor myself have been able to find out anything about S.O. Utting other than he also produced the engravings for Collingwood Bruce's Guide to Hadrian's Wall in the mid 19th century. So clearly, um, he was he was based in London, I think, and um, was producing a number of antiquarian um, works at this uh, for a number of different antiquarian works at this time. Now, Westwood sketched the stone on site, or maybe his daughters did, um, and but he also took rubbings, and I've seen some of the rubbings which survived for the Irish stones in the Bodleian Library in Oxford but there's none that survive as far as I know for the Welsh ones. And these are on very, very thin translucent paper. And this could then, the lines of the rubbing were then, I mean, because you could turn the translucent rubbing round mm -hmm. because you're producing this as a mirror image on the engraving, I mean, on the, on the block. You could then uh, apply the lines using a camera lucida onto the woodblock and then to produce the reverse image, which is then, um, uh, uh, as you can see, carved out still, because this is a relief one. And then that is used for the basis for the ink to print the engraving. So this appeared in uh, this one here from Breckenshire, appeared in Archaeologia Cambrensis in 1858. So we can see it's quite a long and difficult process. But at this time, um, some uh, uh, monuments, the really complicated ones, most of the, the interest in this period is in the early inscribed stones, the fifth to seventh century ones. But where they're reproducing complex sculpture, such as the Nevin Cross, they were turning to more sophisticated engraving techniques. And this is a steel engraving, which you can actually see in the exhibition over there by J.H. Lecoeur um, uh, of the cross at Nevin. And you can see the reproduction. This appeared in Archaeologia Cambrensis in 1860. And you can see it, it reproduction over there again in the exhibition. And this is how it appeared also in Lapidarium Walliai in uh, uh, Westwood's um, uh, publication. So at the moment, it's quite, these uh, engravings are quite um, simple, but we see a major change which starts in the 1780s um, with uh, um, Berwick, the work of Thomas Berwick, but by the middle of the 19th century, I think Archaeologia Cambridge is a bit late with this, actually, 
we see the rise of white line wood engraving. And as soon as this, this goes hand in hand with the actual absolute explosion of popular print works. And I found online here um, the illustrations from the Illustrated London News in about the 1850s of how white line engraving was produced. Basically, you have vast numbers of, of, of um, usually men who are working in the way that you can see in this um, uh, picture um, at a tall desk and their eyesight must have been, you know, dreadful by the time they finished with this, um, producing um, very fine lined, in, they're not in relief, instead you're applying uh, the image using pencil sometimes or a, and a camera lucida onto a small box, um, uh, boxwood block. And you can, it, sometimes it's chalked on top or it's got a white film on top. And then the engraver is using the gravers that you can see in the pictures here to make very fine lines. And you can see the kind of effect in the engravings that are used in the Illustrated London News. And there's this extraordinary machine here for providing um, light, because they were often working in dark conditions in order to concentrate light from an oil lamp onto the uh, wood block that they're using. And um, so we can begin to see much finer um, uh, engravings. And these dominate from about the 1830s to about the 18, the end, by the 1890s, they're going and photography is coming in instead. And we can see this in the pages of Archaeologia Pambrensis um, very clearly. Now, I want to um, move on now to look at Harry Longville Jones, who we heard about last night, and of course was an, uh, the first editor um, uh, of Archaeologia Cambrensis. And he was very interested in early inscribed stones. And we can see some of his um, uh, records here. Firstly, uh, in Archaeologia Cambrensis in 1860, mm -hmm. where uh, so the stone at St. Dog Miles um, is, is published for the first time. This was the first Ogham, bilingual Ogham Latin inscribed stone to be deciphered in Wales um, at a, a, the Cardigan, Cambrian's Cardigan meeting, I think in 1859. And this is a white line engraving. And I think you can see the difference very clearly from the relief engravings we were looking at before. And um, I think you probably can just about make out the inscription and you can see that it's shown in sort of 3D, it's been projected. So you can see the Ogham inscription and the um, Latin inscription as well. And uh, it, at the bottom left, it tells us that Harry Longville Jones, HLJ, is the artist. And on the right, that S.O. Utting is the engraver. And then we can see, um, I think this is probably a different, uh, the overall style of the engraving on the left, the St. Dogmiles one, is very much um, uh, fine lines, you know, very close together. We can see a slightly different style on the right at Llanwenog, which was published uh, a, a year later. And this one is interesting because it's my only reference to a woman uh, pro providing information for this. And this is from the accomplished pencil of Miss Jones of Gwynfrid. But then she had to have other men who went to have to check her sketches and produce more rubbings. And these together, the combination was used to make the engraving. And we can see that already in the 1860s, these white line engravings were very mechanical. The ones of Thomas Barrick were much more artworks, but these are very mechanical, they're produced you know, at a rate of knots in these kind of um, uh, engraving studios, I suppose you'd call them. And by this material, this period, the grass, for example, at the bottom of the right-hand one was probably made by a different artist from the 
person who was in, who was actually engraving the inscription. So it was like a sort of conveyor belt um, in also order to produce these. You know, you, if you've got four arch cam volumes a year and you've got illustrated London news once a week, I should say, you can see the kind of uh, level that you need to produce these four. So um, it's a very different beast, if you like, from the relief um, engravings. So um, we can now move on to the next stage in this development. And um, I want to talk very briefly about the work of Worthington G. Smith, who was the um, Cambrian's um, drafts person in engraver in from 1875 to 1895. Now, he started come to cam, coming to Cambrian's meetings with his sketchbook in 1875. And then he engraved these sketches and these appear very widely in the pages of Archaeologia Cambrensis. Now, he joins the team, so to speak, at the point when engraving is already beginning to, you know, phot photographic methods are already beginning to come in, in, in and these are mechanizing the way that engraving is done because um, after a while you could project the photographic image onto the, in, onto the wood block. For, so you could photograph the rubbing and then project it onto the wood block. So, we can see two of Worthington Smith, his style changes over time, which is very interesting. And we can see in, when he's just starting for the Cambrians in 1876, um, he produces these two uh, uh, engravings from his drawings. And one is of the small cross at Larne um, from the Viking age. And you can see it's still got this kind of 3D effect that we see um, in earlier ones, and then a similar 3D effect for uh, the cross at Llanverhangel Croes Veni in uh, Carmarthenshire. Now, this appears with a note by J.O. Westwood, still, he's still working away in 1876. Now, I think you can see very clearly the standard of these engravings is a lot better than what the Utting firm was producing for um, uh, Harry Longville Jones. Now we can see how his work is developing alongside um, other scholars, and I just need to try and turn the page here. Um, alongside the work of other scholars um, uh, in the pages of Archaeologia Cambrensis, because we're turning more to more scientific drawings. We can see on the left here, um, a, another uh, uh, bilingual stone, the, that from St. Dogwells um, in Pembrokeshire. And the rubbing was originally taken by J. Romilly Allen, who we'll come to in a minute. And it now appears with sections, right? On the right-hand side there. And it was also to scale, though the scale doesn't appear on the, on the engraving, it's quite interesting. And then in 1880, you've got the Caldy Island stone, which is again an Ogham inscription in this case, which has been reused in the late eighth century to produce um, a, a different type of a carved stone with crosses and a major inscription. And this is a scale drawing. The scale drawing is actually noted um, on, the engrave, on the engraving. So we're, we're moving on to scale drawings that are very clear. And again, you can see from uh, Worthington G. Smith's um, engravings that these are of very high quality compared with what we were looking at before. Now, um, at the same time as this is going on, we can see um, experimentation with other techniques because um, in, uh, uh, photography is beginning by the 1870s to have a real impact on um, engravings. Now, I don't know 
anything much about George E. Robinson. But in the um, 1870s, he was producing articles in Archaeology Cambrensis. I think he probably came from somewhere near Cardiff because of what he was interested in. And um, he produced uh, drawings and rubbings of carved stones and then had them printed in Archaeologia Cambrensis using the technique of anastatic printing. And this reaches its most important um, in, uh, in the second half of the 1870s. And on the left here, you can see um, a cross from Coiti near Bridgend. And, um, uh, and on the right, you can see the Trecastle stone, which um, as you can see again, is one of these ones with two phases. On the right, the Ogham and uh, by, you know, the Bogham Latin inscribed stone, which is then upended to produce the later, um, rather crudely in many ways, carved uh, um, uh, cross slab. Now, the, in order for this process to work, the drawing or the rubbing had to be of oil-based ink, right? Now, the original, that's the original drawing, has to be destroyed in this technique. The original is sponged with nitric acid, so it doesn't last for long, um, which um, does not soak into the oil-based surface. The original drawing is then placed onto a plate, a metal plate, and rolled, causing the acid to bite into the plate. So we're seeing, um, I assume that the white areas are where the acid is biting into the plate. And then the ink is applied to the plate to produce the image. Now, this is very much quicker than, um, uh, than engraving it, isn't it? But it is very destructive in the process. But this is a one before photography really begins to take a hold, this one here. And the main producer of these um, uh, uh, in, in the UK, well, in Britain, of um, anesthetic printing was Cowles of Ipswich. It's a German technique, which doesn't really take off in Germany, but it does for a very short period of time take off in Ipswich. So the Cambrians are using this particular um, technique. So um, let's return to engravings and um, J. Romilly Allen and Worthington Smith. Now um, we can see um, J. Romilly Allen, who was also an editor of um, Archaeologia uh, Cambrensis, he um, uh, 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 was most famous for his early Christian monuments of Scotland. But he produced um, his own drawings and we can see the impact of photography here because um, he's, what he's got are, are his drawings of, um, uh, uh, of the stones at St. Edrin's in 1883. And these drawings were photographed onto the engraving, um, thereby doing away for the draft with the draftsman altogether. So you could, that photograph appears, sorry, on the wood block, and then they can cut it really quickly. And um, you can see that these are quite sophisticated drawings. Now, the next thing that happens is um, the last article on Wales that, um, uh, J. Romilly Allen produces is early Christian art in Wales in Archaeologia Cambrensis in 1899. And again, these, the drawing is by uh, Worthington Smith. And you can see that in this case, his drawing is photographed um, onto a mechanically produced metal line plate, which I think that again is in the exhibition that you can go and look at over there. And you can see that the sophistication of the drawing, it's, it's really, these are really beautiful drawings and they are reproduced still in Nash Williams' early Christian monuments of Wales. Now, 
At the same time, in the 1890s, plaster casts um, were beginning to make a mark, as well as photography. And we can see an early cast of the Van Dock Cross um, in Cardiff Museum and Art Gallery um, in the 1890s. And this was produced by the Italian firm in London, Bracciani and Co, who were also working for the v &A. Now it's very interesting that the first photograph of a carved stone, only medieval carved stone that appears in Archaeologia Cambrensis is indeed of a cast, not of the thing itself. And this appears in Archaeologia Cambrensis in 1894. It's a cast of the Conbelin cross in Margam. And um, as you can see, I suppose that um, this was probably uh, taken when Bracciani had, you know, the company had finished making the cast and this is the record that they kept. Now, it takes a while for um, them to start to use um, uh, phot photography in the field. But um, this comes uh, with Sir John Rees. And Sir John Rees, of course, had been publishing as a lingui Celtic linguist. Um, he was the first Celtic professor at Jesus College, Oxford. And he'd been published in, in Archaeologia Cambrensis since the 1870s. But he was the first person to make extensive use of photographs in order, alongside drawings, to record early Christian carved stones in Wales. And the, his first article with photographs appears in 1896. And you can see um, it's of monuments in Cardiganshire, south of Aberystwyth. Um, you can see Hen Venue here and Llanvewi Abarath. And we can see the technique he's using if we look at another monument in that same article at Llanshir. And this is a cross carved stone of which half survives with the inscription. And this appears in 1896. And the photographs are by a Mr. Munro Hughes of the National Provincial Bank in Abereron and his friend, Mr. Pugh. And they go out into the field with their plate camera and they take these excellent photographs. I mean, this one of Fantlier is really good. Um, and uh, the stone has been specially wetted in order to make the inscription stand out. And as you can see, it's, it's accompanied by a line drawing of the inscription. And this combination of um, rubbings, line drawings and uh, photographs was still being used um, by um, Ian Wright and uh, the, uh, myself, if you like, a um, hundred years later, but with the advent of the digital camera and computer drawing packages. So we're still in the same uh, line really. Now, also photography enabled, and I, um, I'm getting on towards the end now, um, uh, recording how in um, the movement of these monuments. And in 1903, um, the, uh, one of the crosses, the one, the Itid cross at Llantwit Major was moved. And this is recorded in, into the church. And this is recorded in the pages of Archaeologia Cambrensis. And though the photographs are not very clear because they're rather small, you can see the stone. I mean, we wouldn't move an early medieval inscribed uh, carved stone like this now. It seems to be propped up with pieces of wood and God knows what there. And then um, we can see um, the drawing showing the relationship to an early medieval, uh, probably an early medieval kiss grave underneath. And um, we can see its final exhibition in the church. And it was only recently that the new exhibition um, was set up. So this is, if you like, reportage appearing in the pages of Archaeologia Cambrensis. Now, um, it's interesting that in the early 20th century, when um, H. Harold Hughes, uh, up to this point, there's not as much work in North Wales as there is around Cardiff, okay, and in the Southwest. But then in the early 20th century, there's much more being recorded in the North. And central to this is the work of H. Harold Hughes, who was a Bangor architect. And his recording of monuments 
is very much influenced by the arts and crafts movement. Um, for example, the work of W.G. Collingwood, whose Northumbrian crosses the pre-Viking age, sorry, pre-Norman age, was published in 1927. And this is just his drawings um, of uh, Penmon Cross because he produced a series of articles in Archaeologia Cambrensis between 1919 and 1924 on uh, the early Christian decorative art on Anglesey. And the title of that, those articles shows you immediately the influence of the arts and crafts movement. Now, um, we can just come finally um, to the work of Radford and Nash Williams. Firstly, um, C.A. Rayleigh Radford, he was responsible um, as an a, a employee of the Royal Commission um, in the production of the Anglesey volume in 1937, which was much more um, modern archaeological techniques were being used than in the previous volumes. And here we can see Rayleigh Radford um, when he was excavating at Glastonbury, but um, you can see from the pages of the 1937 volume, the uh, use of photography, um, and they're taking the monuments sort of as much as they can, you know, all four sides, um, and they're producing um, a photograph of the inscribed stone and then a drawing of the inscription. So, and these again, these images are used in Nash Williams' early Christian monuments of Wales. So, Finally, we come to V.E. Nash Williams, who was also an editor of Archaeologia Cambrensis, and he was very much influenced by uh, uh, Radford's work. And um, we can see um, in his illustrations here, basically, the book was produced in 1950, and it, they had to wait because there wasn't enough paper to print it and the in, images are often very small and it can be they can be frustrating and the images are taken from all the sources he could find so um there was he was criticized at the time for taking photo having photographs taken of the casts and here you can see Landoc it's a cast because it's shiny um in the reproduction and then you can see the kind of standard pictures from a variety of different sources, including Worthington Smith um, in, uh, to illustrate um, other monuments where there were not always photographs. So um, what I've tried to do in this um, talk is I've tried to explain how early medieval carved stones were recorded and illustrated um, from the late 17th century up to the mid 20th century, and that these images are an essential part of their biography, their life history. I've set out to explore the main developments in, and some of the main figures who developed our understanding <coughs> of these monuments in Wales. And I've tried to indicate the importance and the changes in engraving that brought these monuments to the attention of a much wider audience. And Archaeologia Cambrensis was instrumental in doing this in Wales. But also the importance of photography in providing quick, accurate recording um, uh, of monuments, which then end up being, you know, you can print much, much easier. And, but the drawings are continuing to indicate the detail of these monuments. Thanks very much.